Okay, so our next speaker is actually a local. It's Todd Thompson from Ohio State, and he's going to talk about radio, gamma ray, and neutrino emission from star-forming galaxies. So thank you. Hello. Check, check. All right, um, so I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation to speak here. Um, I'd like to thank the Center for Cosmology and Astroparticle Physics and the Astronomy Departments uh, for their support throughout the years. I also want to thank uh, my collaborators, who you'll see mentioned throughout this talk, um, Elliot Quadert and Ellie Waxman, my long-term collaborators on this project, but also uh, a remarkable student who came through Ohio State named Brian Lackey, and uh, Ben Buckman, um, graduate student here right now who's working with me, um, and Tim Linden on galactic winds and cosmic ray-driven winds. Uh, the image you see here is a picture of M82, uh, the core of M82 taken in 6 gigahertz uh, radio emission by the JVLA by um, Marvel. And my job is to show you why the radio emission, and not just the magnitude of the radio emission, but the spectral slope of the radio emission, is so important to understanding the starburst and star-forming galaxy contribution to the diffuse gamma ray and neutrino backgrounds, um, which this conference has dealt with um, in such detail. See if I can advance. Evidently not. Let me try again. Hmm, no. Okay. So to make sure we're all on the same page, I want to start with some simple things, some things we think we know, some things that have been repeated throughout this conference and several of the, uh, um, of the parallel sessions. I got it. Thank you. Um, which is that cosmic rays are injected into a galaxy. Um, they emit and then they escape. Roughly speaking, primary cosmic ray protons and, and electrons are injected by supernovae, um, a fraction of about 10% of the 10 to the 51 ergs per supernova goes into cosmic ray protons, and about one-tenth of that goes into cosmic ray electrons. Those cosmic rays scatter in the galaxy and diffuse outwards, and they may also escape in a cosmic ray-driven wind. Collisions between Cosmic ray protons in the interstellar medium uh, produce pions, produce gamma rays, secondary electrons and positrons, and neutrinos. And at least in the galaxy, we think that approximately 90% of those cosmic ray protons escape the galaxy before they produce pions. Primary electrons and secondary electrons and positrons cool in the ISM via synchrotron, inverse Compton, Bremsstrahlung, and ionization. I went back and looked, and I think that this, um, Krauschar in 1972, was the first detection of the galactic plane in gamma rays um, by OSO3. Uh, and uh, they had about 621 events, and I think this is an interesting map to look at in the context of the recent uh, neutrino detections. They had a very strong correlation with the galactic plane. What do we find today? Today we have the gamma rays here, a much better gamma ray map above 50 MeV, and we have the infrared light. When we look at our galaxy, we see gamma rays, we see infrared light. And when we plot the gamma rays versus the, um, versus the IR, uh, we get this plot from Ackerman, constituted a significant fraction of Keith Bechtel's uh, thesis. Um, we have the infrared light from a galaxy versus the gamma ray light, and we find an approximately linear but somewhat superlinear correlation between the two, stretching from little dwarf galaxies like the SMC all the way up to, in this case, NGC 1068, and later I'll talk to you about ARP 220. We think that these GV, vot GV photons are all from primary cosmic ray uh, interacting with the interstellar medium, producing pions, pions to two gamma. Some of these galaxies are spatially resolved, some not. Um, new detections like ARP220 and Circinus I'll get to, and they're importantly missing from this diagram are the TEV detections of some local starbursts like M82 and NGC 253. So we observe gamma rays, we observe far infrared, we also observe radio continuum and far infrared. Um, for example, in M82, if we look at the spectral energy distribution at one gigahertz, we see the radio emission. And here we see, and this is important, that the diffuse emission at one gigahertz for star-forming galaxies has a spectral index of approximately minus 0.7. This quantity here, the emission at 1.4 gigahertz, and the dust continuum, which is located here, which is reprocessed dust light uh, from stars, form what we call the far-infrared radio correlation. 
And here it is, from Yoon 2001, this is approximately 1,809 uh, IRAS sources. And here again is the far IR luminosity. The Milky Way would be right about there in this diagram, and here is the 1.4 uh, gigahertz luminosity. Approximately, the luminosity in gigahertz is about one one millionth of the far IR luminosity. It's constant for all galaxies, it's a linear correlation. What you're seeing is diffuse synchrotron, not synchrotron from sources, not synchrotron from sources, diffuse synchrotron in the galaxy. And those electrons that are emitting, at least in our galaxy like ours with the microgauss magnetic field, are about a few GeV. The far IR radio correlation holds on 100 parsec scales. It also holds at high redshift. And although there are many um, references on the far IR radio correlation, the discovery was by van der Kruet, um, significant development by De Jong and Helou, and then recently at high, res at high redshift, Iveson and Smolchic. Why are we interested in this? We're interested in this because the radio and gamma ray, and I think neutrino far IR correlations, the neutrino far IR correlation not yet established, but I hope so soon, um, provide strong constraints uh, on the cosmic rays and magnetic fields of galaxies from normal galaxies to starburst galaxies. In particular, in our own galaxy, the energy density of turbulence, the energy density of cosmic rays, the energy density of magnetic fields, and the energy density of photons are all approximately equal to the energy density you would need to support the galaxy in hydrostatic equilibrium. That is when you see that very thin band of gamma rays, or radio, or far IR emission in the galaxy, and you wish to talk about whether or not the gas can be maintained in vertical hydrostatic equilibrium, there's a certain pressure that required, and that pressure is roughly pi g sigma squared. The fundamental questions we want to know, from an astrophysical point of view, are can cosmic rays drive winds and affect galaxy formation? As you all know, the most important questions in cosmology are the nature of dark matter and the nature of dark energy. But the third is how galaxies form. Um, many times I argue it's more important than the other two, but we could have a debate about that. Um, we want to know how galaxies form. We want to know how their baryons are cycled through them. We want to know how their baryons are ejected. And many people today um, are interested in whether or not cosmic rays might do the job. We also want to know if the magnetic field is dynamically important in all galaxies. We want to know if cosmic ray populations in galaxies are similar to the Milky Way. We want to know if star-forming galaxies dominate the gamma ray background at GeV. And we want to know whether or not star-forming galaxies can be a source, a source or potentially the source of the PEV neutrinos. An important consideration when I talk about the local starbursts that I'm about to get into, like M82 and NGC 253, is that they have these winds. In the local universe, these are freaks. They're not normal in the sense of average. They're very rare, starburst galaxies are. But at redshift one, all galaxies, all star-forming galaxies, have winds, and they have star formation rate densities that are very similar to these. So I'm going to use them as exemplars of what might be going on at high redshift. Also, galaxies exhibit remarkable dynamic range. Here's a plot, a famous plot by Kennecott 1998 showing the gas surface density of a bunch of different galaxies. The Milky Way would be down here, spanning from here all the way up to here. And I want you to remember that the average density of these galaxies varies from about one particle per cubic centimeter, just the gas density, to 100 particles per cubic centimeter to over 10 to the 4 particles per cubic centimeter. And when I'm trying to talk to you about the far infrared radio correlation and the radio emission of galaxies, it's important to remember that the Bremsstrahlung ionization and pion times are all inversely proportional to the density. There's over seven decades in photon energy density and probably seven decades in magnetic energy density, which affects the inverse Compton and secretron cooling times. And there's over six decks in this total hydrostatic pressure, that is the pressure to maintain these galaxies in hydrostatic equilibrium. When you think about the Milky Way and you think that the mag mag magnetic energy density is similar to the photon energy density, and you think about pion losses not being important, that might be true for the Milky Way, but that is not true for all star-forming galaxies observed at high redshift, all of them. They're all denser than the Milky Way by a factor of 10 or 100. Doesn't mean they don't exist at high redshift, we just haven't detected them. So a first theory of the far infrared radio correlation starts with the so-called electron calorimeter theory of Volk and Lisenfeld. What they say is that massive stars are born, galaxies are forming massive stars, those massive stars produce UV light, that UV light is absorbed by dust, it produces far infrared light. All of those massive stars then explode as core collapse supernovae with 10 to the 51 ergs per supernova. A fraction, 1% of 10 to the 51 ergs per supernova goes into cosmic ray electrons. All of those cosmic ray electrons cool via synchrotron before they escape, and you end up with a one-to-one -one correlation between the gigahertz synchrotron emission and the far infrared correlation. 
That actually predicts the magnitude of the far infrared radio correlation and is a great starting order of magnitude theory. It would hold across a wide diversity of galaxies. If a few percent of the supernova energy goes in, you would have this. All you require is that the synchrotron cooling time is much shorter than the escape time. That is, the electrons cool and deposit their energy in the galaxy as a calorimeter. And that would be a great theory, and I would have nothing to say at all about neutrinos or gamma rays if it wasn't for this fact of synchrotron cooling. If synchrotron losses or inverse Compton losses dominate the cooling of galaxies and the synchrotron cooling lifetime is very short compared to the escape time, then the radio spectra of galaxies should be steep. This comes from the fact that synchrotron power is proportional to energy squared of the electrons so that the cooling time E over E dot is one over E. What that does is in the limit of very strong cooling, it makes a very steep spectrum. So if you inject a spectrum, you can choose what it is, but let's say 2.2. 2.2 divided by two is 1.1, um, okay? And we would expect a synchrotron spectrum of 1.1, but we do not observe that. We observe synchrotron spectra in the range of minus 0.7. And this caused people for a long time to think that all the electrons in all the galaxies are in the weak cooling limit and that the calorimeter theory can't possibly work because the calorimeter theory predicts steep spectra and we do not observe steep spectra. Yet calorimetry must hold. It must be true, at least in some systems. And how can I prove that to you? I can take an extreme example. I can take the most extreme example on the far infrared radio correlation or on that plot of galaxies, a galaxy like ARP220, which is a famous local ultraluminous infrared galaxy, super duper dense, super duper duper and a high energy density of photons. And I can prove to you that that galaxy at least has to be in the calorimetric limit, okay? We don't really know B a priori for this galaxy, but we do know the photon energy density. We can make measurements of how compact the galaxy is, how much light it's emitting, and thus it's inverse Compton cooling time. And the inverse Compton cooling time is a thousand years. Okay? It's, you know, roughly speaking, the age of an empire on Earth. It's extremely short. Okay? And it looks weird to have the inverse Compton time with a B in it, I know. But the reason I did that is because we observe ARP220 at gigahertz. Thus, I'm picking electrons from the synchrotron spectrum that are emitting at gigahertz. And so the magnetic field appears in here, and I've scaled for three milligauss. Okay. ARP220's photon energy density is at least a million times the Milky Way's. That's why this number is so short. So if you wanted to say calorimetry can't exist, so T escape is less than T inverse Compton, that would mean that cosmic ray electrons would have to be evicted out of ARP220 at over 20,000 kilometers per second. That just doesn't happen. It just doesn't. Okay. You don't have cosmic rays being evicted out. We see gigahertz photons. They emit. So thus, T cool has to be less than T escape. And I would say that electron calorimetry reigns. We're in the rapid cooling limit where the energy density of cosmic ray electrons is much less than the energy density of magnetic fields. So here I've told you that electron calorimetry is a beautiful explanation for the far infrared radio correlation. And I've told you that it's wrong because it predicts steep spectra. But then for an extreme example, I've shown you that it has to be electron calorimetric. Now sometimes you choose extreme examples um, because you learn new physics from them. And this is one of those cases. The question is, how can we solve the spectral index problem? How can we solve the problem that ARP220 spectral index is almost minus 0.5 or 0.6 instead of minus 1.1? The answer is Bremsstrahlung and ionization. Electrons don't just cool via synchrotron and inverse Compton. They cool via Bremsstrahlung and ionization losses, and those have different energy dependencies than synchrotron. Synchrotron is an energy squared process, but the power cooled in Bremsstrahlung, relativistic Bremsstrahlung and ionization have different energetic dependencies and can flatten the cosmic ray spectrum. But you have to say, you have to say that the Bremsstrahlung and ionization cooling times are similar to the synchrotron and inverse Compton cooling times in order to get the flat spectra, in order for the eventual steady state spectra to work out. When you compute the Bremsstrahlung and ionization cooling times for these, this ridiculous galaxy, ARP220, where the average density is 10 to the 4 particles per cubic centimeter, you get, again, approximately 1,000 years. Okay. So if cosmic ray electrons are simultaneously cooled by synchrotron, after all, it's the synchrotron photons you're seeing, but their, cosmic, their underlying electron population is shaped by losses from relativistic Bremsstrahlung and ionization, then you expect flat spectra, 
and that can solve this flat spectrum problem while simultaneously saying you're in a beam dump and the electron are radiating everything. So well, what about the far infrared radio correlation? If all of a sudden I'm telling you that in very dense galaxies, Bremsstrahlung and ionization losses are important, then that means there should be less radio power because more power is going into Bremsstrahlung and ionization. So that would mean that dense starbursts should be radio dim. The power in electrons is going to Bremsstrahlung and ionization. And remember, from the far infrared radio correlation, all these galaxies, 1,809 galaxies, that dot and that dot right next to each other could be different in density by a factor of 100. And the answer, and the reason why we get to neutrinos, finally, is from secondary electrons and positrons from protons. If cosmic ray electrons are interacting with the average density gas and they cool via Bremsstrahlung and ionization, then so should the cosmic ray protons. And the cosmic ray proton death time, cooling time, death time, the, the time it takes for a relativistic proton to die via pions is approximately the same amount of time as the Bremsstrahlung and ionization cooling time in these galaxies. Okay. If the proton time, the time to die via pions is short compared to the escape time, then you're again in the calorimetric limit, but we're not in the electron calorimetric limit now, we're in the proton calorimetric limit. That means all protons die before they escape. They produce secondary electrons and positrons, gamma rays, and neutrinos. Okay. And this theory that I'm proposing, that we proposed about five or six years ago, says that the extra radio emission is made up for by the secondaries. The conclusion would be that the radio emission of starbursts is dominated by secondary electrons and positrons, not primary electrons like it is in the Milky Way. And this, uh, and this then would be that the dense galaxies are in the far infrared radio correlation because of pionic losses. Just to say things graphically, okay, from the slide I borrowed from my student, Brian. If we had pure electron calorimetry, the far infrared and the radio would be balanced, okay, with essentially no free parameters. But we want to solve, excuse me, we want to, boy, that's touchy. We want to solve the spectral index problem and in order to solve the spectral index problem, we need Bremsstrahlung and ionization to be important to flatten the spectra. But that breaks the far infrared radio correlation. Wow, it will not stay on that. Um, so what we need is secondary electrons and positrons to come in and save the day in dense galaxies so that two galaxies of dramatically different density at the same position in the far infrared radio correlation can sit on the same radio correlation. And we call this a conspiracy and many people have asked me, is this conspiracy or physics? I would say it's physics, but it's somewhat in the eye of the beholder. You may consider this to be a complicated Rube Goldberg machine. I don't. And the reason is, is that it's just physics that Bremsstrahlung and ionization losses go like one over N, and that pionic losses go over one over N. And so it is true that as the density increases, the Bremsstrahlung and ionization losses will sap energy from the electron field. And it is also true that the protons will die faster and make up that electron-positron pairs that then fill in that radio emission. However, we require, this theory requires that the energy injected by, over, from, in electrons to the energy injected in protons is a factor of one to 10. Now, a lot of people would say that's uh, a conspiracy and not physics, but many of my colleagues who study non-relativistic particle acceleration would tell me that this ratio is expected from non-relativistic shocks or may be expected from non-relativistic shocks and that we see this in local supernova remnants. It didn't have to be that in order to get a linear far infrared radio correlation over five decades in gas density, you need this ratio to be approximately 10 to one, but you do. Predictions and consequences, I'll spend a little time going through this. This means that galaxies with high gas densities have enhanced gamma ray and neutrino luminosities per unit star formation. Proton calorimetry predicts a relationship between the gamma ray luminosity and the far infrared luminosity that is linear and has that normalization. It also predicts GeV gamma ray and maybe PeV backgrounds. There's, um, Older work, and even much older work, um, but here I'm citing Pavlidou and Fields, Loeb and Waxman, uh, my own work, Cota's work, um, Tambora, uh, Ando is 15, but also um, the, um, the pseudo talk uh, during this meeting addressed these issues. 
We predict that the spectral index flattens as the density increases, and we predict the radio spectra of galaxies. We predict that high redshift galaxies should maintain the far infrared radio correlation, but not sub so called submillimeter galaxies. We predict that the energy density in magnetic fields in galaxies is not equal to the energy density in cosmic rays. People like to assume this, the so-called equipartition or minimum energy arguments from Burbage in the late 1950s. We do not find that to be true in starburst galaxies. We find that the magnetic energy density is very big in dense galaxies, but is small compared to that gravity, that gravitational pressure I mentioned. Okay. We find, for example, that in ARP220, this big, beastie um, starburst galaxy, that the magnetic fields are three to five milligauss. That's not a typo. Okay, that's not a typo. Three to five milligauss, not microgauss, three to five milligauss. And those have been confirmed. I put a twiddle in here because I can have a long discussion about how that might not be true, um, but we can talk about it. This also says that the cosmic ray energy density, the proton cosmic ray energy density, is small compared to gravity in starburst galaxies. This is big compared to the Milky Way. In the Milky Way, maybe some number of EV per cubic centimeter, it might be a thousand times that in these starburst galaxies, but it's still small compared to gravity. Okay. And I think that's big trouble for cosmic ray driven winds because a big gamma ray flux from a galaxy means that your protons are dying and they're dying fast. And that means that the equilibrium energy density of cosmic ray protons in that galaxy is lower than you think it is. High gamma rays means low cosmic ray energy density, means maybe you have a problem driving your galactic winds. So we go back to this correlation. This is the observed correlation um, as of Ackerman et al. 2012. Again, dwarf galaxies, a bunch of upper limits, and so on. You can divide these two axes by each other, um, as was done in that paper, and you get the proton calorimetric limit, which is right there, and some galaxies um, are somewhat below it. If you order these galaxies by gas density, um, which is what we did here in um, Lackey's papers. As a function of gas surface density, you predict that the gamma ray to far AR should increase and approach the calorimetric limit. And I should say that this line and these regions um, were in before uh, the Fermi data. So these are, in a sense, I mean, in the, in the usual sense of the word, predictions. So you won't be, so it feels like we have a complete theory. And what I've tried to do um, is convince you that these spectral indices um, and the radio emission is important for understanding what the gamma ray emission will be. Um, and so you imagine my surprise when we encountered uh, super calorimetric extragalactic gamma ray sources, um, which sounds like, you know, feels like I should do a dance with that. Um, and so we started thinking a little bit about scatter. So there's this galaxy, Circinus, um, here. Uh, which is a local Seifert galaxy. Some of you are thinking like, um, de little, little, um, de I know. Um, anyway, only a fraction of you got that. It's okay. So uh, you can talk about it during the coffee. Um, the, and there's recent detection of finally ARP220 here, which is more gamma ray luminous than we expected. And so Circinus, interestingly, has an AGN sitting in the center. So it's 1068, 49, 45. Um, but there are a couple of sources of scatter I want to leave you with. These are new ideas. Um, some new ideas in, uh, in, in this field, or potentially new, or things that could change things, let me put it that way. The first is non-steady star formation. So Tim Linden and I are working on an idea right now um, where we try to break calor calorimetry. It would be nice to find a way to make a galaxy super calorimetric, um, and we can pretty easily. The way you do it is you say, I have an instantaneously born uh, star formation, uh, and in instantaneously born star formation, what happens if you have a burst of star formation like a big massive star cluster, you produce a bunch of massive stars. And then you wait, and three mega years passes, and then the first supernova explodes. And the last supernova explodes, you know, 60 solar masses, 50 solar masses, 40 solar masses, all the way down to 10 solar masses. The last supernova explodes at about 50 mega years. And depending on whether or not you take an instantaneously formed stellar population that's rotating or non-rotating, you get a burst of supernovae that looks like this from 3 mega years to 50 mega years. And if you compare that to the light that's produced, remember we're talking about the gamma rays to the light or the neutrinos to the light or the secondaries to the starlight, you find that the ratio of the gamma ray luminosity to the bolometric luminosity is different from your steady state calorimetric. Steady state calorimetry is here, 
1.1 or so times 10 to the minus 4, 1.5 times 10 to the minus 4. It can actually be 3 to 4 times higher, or so I wrote 4 to 6, but it's actually more like, you know, let's say 3 to 5 times higher. And Circinus, in fact, there's evidence for a central burst of star formation on 10 to the 7 years old that might actually work for Circinus. You might also wonder about this 10 to the 51 ergs. A lot of us throw around this 10 to the 51 ergs all the time. The number of times 10 to the 51 ergs was said in this conference is very large. But the supernovae don't explode with just one energy, and we do not yet have a complete census of supernovae, nor their energies, nor their cosmic ray acceleration efficiencies, nor in the diversity of galaxies or environments that you would actually encounter at a universe at redshift one. Assassin, a local uh, supernova group run by Stanek and Kachanek and others, um, there's a talk this afternoon, is trying to make a complete census of star-forming galaxies here I'm just, uh, of, of supernovae and um, of all types. And one of those types is type 2P supernovae. Here's a plot from Pehan Prieto to Ohio State Products, who have recently done something very nice. This is the nickel mass inferred from type 2 supernovae as a function of energy. And you can see the energy span from 10 to the 50 ergs to almost 10 to the 52 ergs. What would a complete census of type 2P supernovae um, actually reveal about the energy injection rate of supernovae um, in galaxies? And what then would we infer for the cosmic ray injection rate in galaxies? All right, so I want to conclude. Um, the radio, neutrino, and gamma ray, far IR correlations, I think strongly constrain the cosmic ray populations and magnetic fields of star-forming galaxies. I think star-forming galaxies are electron calorimeters, full stop. I think calculations of the diffuse gamma ray and neutrino background, some of which I've seen in this conference and in the literature, should really take into account the far infrared radio correlation as a function of redshift, and not just the luminosities of the galaxies and the radio but the shapes of their spectra. The shapes of their spectra are directly controlled by Bremsstrahlung and ionization losses, I think, and that is directly coupled to their gamma ray. So it might just be that radio observations tell you what the gamma ray luminosity of galaxies should be, and hence what their neutrino luminosities should be. Okay. Dense gas galaxies approach this proton calorimeter limit. Low cosmic ray energy densities in dense galaxies, which I think has implications for winds, um, what is the calorimetric fraction of the universe? That's what you would like to know to actually make a calculation of the PEV neutrinos. And the problem there is that we need to have um, gas measurements of galaxies at high redshift, which are coming with ALMA and submillimeter telescopes. And then we need to understand the radio spectral indices in order to constrain Bremsstrahlung and ionization losses and thus to understand the protons and the secondary neutrinos and gammas. Thank you. All right, thank you, Todd, for a great talk. Um, do anybody have any questions? Uh, so there's one over here and one, I think, over here. Can you go back two slides while I'm waiting for the mic? Sorry. To your, uh, keep going. That one will do. Uh, I just wanted to point out there's an issue there. As you can see, you have detections running along the bottom set by the gamma ray sensitivity, and you have a dispersion up to higher values which is set by the lack of sensitivity. So while I, I agree this is very interesting, you have to be very careful because that's a censored sample. There may very well be galaxies that lie far off the gamma ray far infrared correlation that are not included, and that could be a factor in interpreting the, applying this to high redshift without that information. Yeah, well, I definitely, so the, the limited answer or li limited response to your comment is that certainly AGN, right? We, we don't, I mean, blazars are not necessarily going to lie on this. We know that things differ very strongly from the far infrared radio correlation up and down. And this is absolutely a censored sample. You would expect to find the highest flux things and thus the highest luminosity things at fixed distance. I fully agree. Um, I fully agree. Uh, my point only was to note that there are ways to get supercalorimetric fluxes. Um, if you so desire. Yeah, and I, th I believe that those were also discussed uh, several years ago by uh, Spoon and company in dealing with some of these very compact sources. Interesting. So there's okay. an effort, there's been an effort to try and detect these. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? There was one over there somewhere. Yeah, down here.
So uh, going forward, what suite of measurements could you see being made to help answer the underlying questions you referred to earlier in your talk about what sort of baryonic feedback you get in early galaxy formation history? And, and um, yeah. So I think um, at least for baryonic physics and feedback, um, I think this in, the, these types of studies indicate that low density galaxies like the Milky Way might be good at good at driving cosmic ray driven winds um, in them, whereas in dense galaxies, maybe some other mechanism uh, might have to do it. Okay, that's not by any means established, but people talk about hot supernova driven winds, radiation pressure driven winds, and so on. Um, what this work, I, I think, one thing we can do, work that um, Ben Buckman is working on. Um, is we can try, this is uh, going beyond one's own models, uh, it's work Ben um, d discussed in his parallel session, is that we can try to make models of M82 in this case, where you see the gamma ray on the left, which is unresolved, but it's a model, um, and on the right, we look at the vertical distribution, the vertical distribution of the radio emission, and the vertical distribution of the radio emission and the spectral index, again, encodes what's going on with the electron population and if, or the electron positron population. And if that's dominated by secondaries, then that gives us a handle on what's happening with the protons. And we can get a good idea of what's going on with the cosmic ray pressure gradient, cosmic ray pressure gradient in the vertical direction of M82, which directly informs the wind physics. So we can do things um, like that. At high redshift, we have radio observations. Uh, we will not likely have any gamma ray observations of normal star forming galaxies uh, at high redshift, at least to my knowledge in my lifetime, um, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, but maybe the diffuse gamma ray background is already that measurement. Um, so I think what we can do is we can probe the radio and we can probe the gas content of those galaxies at high redshift. Now we're starting with ALMA to be able to detect many galaxies and their gas content, normal galaxies at high redshift, which are still extreme by local universe standards. And we can use that to inform what we think is going on with the cosmic ray proton. Thank you. All right, is there any more questions? If not, thank Todd and Hitoshi for the great talks today, so thank you.